thank you all. Thank you, honestly, for all the support. And I'm calling David now. Uh, David. Thank you. Yeah, well, wait a minute. Let me start. Okay. Sure. Okay. David, can you hear me? Yes, I can feel. Oh, good. Did you say can feel? Uh, no, I don't want to can you yet, but yes, I can. Yes, you can can me? Yes, well, but I wouldn't. Well, you might. <laughs> do you want me to shut off the Skype right now and proceed solo, or do you want to be an obedient professor? I'll be an obedient professor for, uh, for uh, at least 60 minutes. Oh, you can go on, you know, 75, 90 minutes. Uh, I'm sort of tired, so I'm, and I'm tired for a good reason. I'm tired because I've been getting so much good information. Uh, and by the way, just for my wife, Denise Irene Clark McConnell, I slept nine hours straight last night, which is a record. I'm sure I've not gone nine hours straight in the last two years. So I interpret that as victory is imminent. And David, I, uh, I've got a conversation going on that you're not aware of unless you've checked the radio show ad. Uh, but Jason Goodman, myself, and a fellow who I've known from, uh, or a lady, well, you never know if it's a fellow or a lady. Well, there's one way to check, but I'm a gentleman. Um, there's somebody in Canada who has just released the names of a whole bunch of high-level pedophiles. And uh, Jason, myself, and the lady, the male, or the transgender misfit from Canada, will be doing a radio show on this very subject tonight, tomorrow, Wednesday, or Friday. And then, as you're probably aware, Denise and I will be participating in a conference in Klangolan, North Wales, beginning the 14th of May. David, over to you. Well, wow. well, that's uh, fantastic news. But on the subject of pedophiles, I think we all need to be aware of who is the tracker. And the number one tracker of pedophiles online is an American who spent 25 years with the FBI. Is he, and he, does he have a real fat face? Yeah, he does. Is he really a dumb shit? Uh, I'm not sure how dumb he is. He's uh, cunning as a fox, I would say. Does he wear glasses? Yes. Does his last name sound like devil? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell everybody who it is. I obviously don't have a fucking clue. <laughs> well, it's the man who took his son and daughter-in-law off Pan Am 103 before it took off to crash over Lockerbie. Yes, and uh, he probably thought that nobody would ever catch him by the balls. Uh, we've got him by more than that. We've got him in the web of evil that stretches all the way into the company he's working with in the United Kingdom to track down pedophiles and blackmail them and extort them, which is Circo. Can I guess what the name of that corporation is? Yeah, go ahead. I think you just told me, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Well, retract that statement so it can't be proven that I already knew because you told me. Okay, I retract it and I didn't say Circo. Okay, I guess it's Circo because there's a couple of grandsons of Winston Churchill who like Jim a whole lot. For instance, one time he was talking to some pig-faced woman and the woman said, uh, Winston, you're drunk. You know, wait a minute, David, I'm going back 12 years now. Right. Did we ever have a similar conversation? Hey, <laughs> yes, I suppose. Yeah, okay, good. That that shows how, how much in tune with reality we are. So this woman said, Winston, you're drunk. And he said, yes, Lady Pig's Face, but in the morning, I will still, I will be sober and you'll still be a pig's face. Do you know that quote? Yeah, more or less. I think it was uh, Bessie B Braddock, who looks like the backside of an outside privy. And she said to him, yes, you're right, you're drunk. And he said, well, madam, you're ugly, but tomorrow I'll be sober. Well, I wish I would have thought about that on the 6th of December of 2006, so that when you pigeonholed me and you said, are you a pilot? And I said, yes. And you said, are you an airline pilot or a military pilot? And I said both. 
and you said, oh, this is just like Christmas. Are you a drunk? Okay, over to you, David. Yes, that's right. Well, um, let's see, that was December the 6th, was it? Yeah, it was, uh, when, it was a Wednesday at 6 p.m., not that I'm keeping track. Okay, now, something you did subsequently, and I think it was probably one of the most brilliant moves of your illustrious career, uh, notwithstanding who wrote it, you filed a document in North Dakota court, right? Yes, I filed a document on the 27th of February of 2000. Wait a minute, let me think about this. Uh, oh, 2007, February 27th of 2007. But I think you're alluding to the one I filed in the North Dakota court in Fargo, North Dakota on May Day, which is the 1st of May of 2007. Is that correct, Your Lordship? Yes, it is. And uh, I'd like you, if you wouldn't mind, just going over why you filed it and why you didn't serve any of the plaintiff defendants over to you. Well, number one, I filed it because you told me to file it and you were sitting there shivering in your little booties saying, holy shit, I don't have the balls to file, file it. I wonder if I can trick drunky breath into doing it. And then, so I went in on May 1st of 2007, and I'm going to say this, well, wait a minute, I think somebody just put it in. Okay, Go Banks put in the uh, February 27th of 2007 filing, but Go Banks, and I don't know if the Telford Russians here, let me just check. I'm not going to call him by his real name. That's okay. He's not here, but Denise is here, and uh, Dixie Gypsy's here, and DCA Jill's here. So we've got... Uh, Three in the place of one. Yeah, okay, on the 1st of May of 2007, I filed Hawks Cafe versus Global Guardians. And off the top of my head, because you know, David, I have, I have really diminished powers of recall. Off the top of my head, we named about 100 defendants out of the 120, but it could be as high as 122 principles of the attack of 9-11, which... I am confident uh, that President Trump and one of the Marine generals will wish us to address under oath in a courtroom without a gold fringe flag. And the name of that uh, doc, that trial, whatever you call it, that court filing, was Hawks Cafe versus Global Guardians, 1st of May of 2007. It was filed in the uh, district court. No, no, excuse me, the U.S court, District of North Dakota, and as a bonus uh, suggestion, only to see it's sort of like time release medicine, which if you're taking medicine, whether in the Canada, the UK, or the US, the medicine is going to kill you over time. Well, you know, we're doing the same thing to the guilty bastards that are headquartered under the franchise of George H.W. Bush, Christine Marcy, uh, Hillary Clinton, John McCain, and uh, one other guilty bastard or bitch uh, that shall remain nameless until 22 minutes after the hour. Uh, so it's right now 12 minutes after the hour, and in the next 10 minutes, I or you will release the name of the fifth party. Uh, but the name of that court, let me just see, yeah, Hawks Cafe. There you go, thank you, GoBanks. Uh, oh, by the way, Go Banks, I'm going to be coming over to the United Kingdom very shortly, as in I'm going to leave Tuesday of next week. Now, I, I would never, ever announce my travel plans in advance, because if I were to say I'm going to be on Delta 10 leaving Minneapolis from gate G6, and then I'll be leaving within three minutes ahead of schedule, and then I'll be arriving at uh, Terminal 3. I hope that's right. Denise, am I right? Is it Terminal 3? and we will be arriving 17 minutes ahead of schedule. Uh, I, I would never want to announce that I'm traveling on Delta 10 next Tuesday, the 8th of May, because some nefarious pig fucker might try to interrupt my travel, in which case I would just have to wipe the sleep out of my eyes and tell them, catch me if you can. David, over to you. Yeah, right, so thank you, Field, and so, um... I believe our collective decision that uh, in the four and a half months after our initial discussion, when I established that you were a military and a civilian pilot and you'd said that you weren't a drunk, 
Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, I had my fingers crossed when I said that. (laughs) But anyway, anyway. I don't know if it was that particular conversation, but it was very soon afterwards. You mentioned you had a sister who was a bureaucrat in Washington, but you didn't know what she did. Um, So I delved into this woman's record and decided, I don't know if we use that term, that she was the meta mistress of the rebels. Yes. For I want to attack. But I think we we also knew intuitively or instinctively that we didn't have all of the information we needed to serve the uh, defendants to what was effectively a mega claim for wrongful deaths, probably triple damages for wrongful deaths for the people who died on 911 and related events. Well, Field, I think we now know exactly who to go after and who to serve, right? Oh, I think so. I think uh, people should serve me because I enjoy being served. Have you ever seen the British sitcom, Are You Being Served? Yeah, it's hilarious. Well, do you think I wrote that? Uh, You could have played a part in that. I don't know which part. Well, I'm playing a part in it right now, and I don't know which part either, but I do see that uh, there's a wild javelina, which is a pig, having its way with David Cameron, thanks to Braveheart, who is an Air Force friend of mine that I've never met. Uh, but we will meet. Oh, David, guess what? I think the uh, Texas ranch is going to happen, but don't let me take you off your stride. You go ahead with your professor like uh, Dick. <clears throat> Dick. <clears throat> yeah, how come every time I think I of think it? You want di- I think you need to complete that. It's probably what you're trying to say is diction. No, dictation. But every time yeah. I try to see dictation, I think of Dick Cheney because on Christmas Eve of... 2003, I should have had a fatal accident, or at least a hall loss accident at Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, and I'll, I'll fill that in in the fiction in the radio. In fact, I'll, I'll put a brief synopsis in the radio show ad. But uh, anyway, we didn't, the airplane I was flying, which was illegal, by the way, it was, I'm going to say this slowly because there's so much shit going on with the airline industry. Uh, Northwest Airlines on that night in history, which now that I think of it, was not 1224, it's 1225, meaning Christmas Day. The evening of Christmas Day of 2003, I flew an A320 Airbus into Jackson Hole, and we should have gone off the runway. And uh, when you go off the runway at Jackson Hole, uh, you're, n- you're really in deep kimchi, because it's a whole bunch of rocks out there. And so we would have trashed the airplane, but we didn't trash the airplane because I cheated. Now, what I've just told you is A, Northwest Airlines sent an illegal airplane to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and B, I cheated, okay? Those are both true statements. And if anybody wants to criticize me for that, uh, I would have to clear my eyes out before I address them. But the bottom line is, we didn't put a scratch on the fucking airplane. So I would say Michael Huerta, who just got hired by Delta Airlines, and Delta Airlines, to whom I first reported the illegal modifications of the Boeing aircraft, I think Michael Huerta and the board of directors of Delta Airline probably need to communicate with me before I get assertive. David, over to you. Right. Thank you, Phil. So... We use the term Global Guardian because that was the name of the continuity of government exercise on 911. But probably the proper group of individuals or entities we should have referred to as Global Custodians. Now, what I didn't know then is that whilst there was an office of the Global Custodians at the top of the North Tower, I didn't know that the Global Custodians effectively had a using or were using Circo as a proxy for the attack of 911. So when the Circo shareholders met on the 47th floor of the North Tower that morning, and as far as I know, all of their representatives escaped without unscathed, if that's the right word, there was, I believe, about $100 trillion of assets under management amongst the shareholders described as the global custodians. Now, Circo was set up through a management buyout and an IPO by one of your favorite banking friends, Field. Do you know who they are? Uh, 
Okay. Yes, I'm sure I do, but you have to tell me. I'm putting something in the chat room, which I will read to you. Agent McDime, can you keep a secret regarding my seat number next Tuesday on Delta 10? Um, Melania's white hat. Okay. Anyway, uh, is the bank in question in the United States or in the United Kingdom? In the United Kingdom. Oh, is it HSBC? No, it's much older than that. Oh, it's the Bank of England. No, 1811 it was set up. It's the fifth oldest bank in the UK. Give me a hint. Starts with initial N, then M, and then the name of an illustrious family, if you will. Uh, you, you know, I'm thinking right now you might be talking about Anna, Anna Rothschild, in which case, if I were sure my personal hygiene were adequate, I would turn around and moon the camera. So my official guess at this late hour is N.M. Rothschild. Uh, I think you're right. And that leads us to the creation of the six eyes countries uh, off the back of the five eyes through a back door into the British and American patent office. And I've just popped in a little uh, thing about the NSA maintaining a secret Five Eyes satellite facility in Israel. And I've only just picked up on this actually this morning, Phil. Okay, is this, are you talking about the Jerusalem spy station serves as an entirely different purpose? It satellites, dishes, tracks, uh, U.S. satellites around the world and presumably up and download information from them that can be relayed to other facilities where the data can be analyzed. A second Israeli source informs me that this facility is part of Israel's participation in what is be called Five Eyes, but which, if true, should be called Six Eyes. And David, I want to point out something. Are you ready? I am ready. Well, first of all, kiss my ass and tell me I got it right. Uh, you got it right. That was a two- but I'm not going to kiss you nice. Oh, well, I'll tell you what. I, I will extend an olive branch to you. Anytime in the future where you are moved to wish to well anyway you know where I'm I'll, going. Hit you, I'll hit you with the olive branch maybe you're into that kind of stuff oh I love it yes hurt me uh, no but did you know that Diego Garcia has taken over for uh, Pine Gap which is Alice Springs in Australia um, I don't believe it but anyway go ahead well I don't care if you believe it I just said did you know and the answer is apparently no, because if you don't believe it, you must not know it. Uh, do you know which lesbian politician in the United Kingdom stepped down yesterday? Yeah, that woman Rudd, wasn't it? Yeah, Amber. Yeah, and uh, I don't know. Let me just see if uh, a certain correspondent, uh, you know, I never mention names, so I wouldn't say, um, I would never ever mention Alan Dransfield or Agent Dranny. Uh, but he's not in the chat room, but Denise is, and a guy named Bob from Camberley is, and Gobsmack is. And I think one of those three might tell me why it's significant that Amber Rudd, or Rude, uh, stepped down and how that foments for the future of, of Cucumber Girl. David, over to you. Right, so the Sixth Eyes country and I'd never thought of that. I'd seen the film Spectre, um, and uh, that was interesting because it seemed to indicate there was a movement from MI6 for a, a Nine Eyes yep. arrangement, uh, where the four extra eyes would be Brazil, Russia, India, and China, bringing in 40% uh, of the world's population, if you will, to mount, if that's the right word, the Five Eyes high-tech surveillance systems. It never occurred to me, for whatever reason, I don't know, that Israel might have muscled in to the gap between the BRIC and the Five Eyes countries uh, through N.M. Rothschild and some. It's all dropping into place, still because some organization, and I have to believe that that would be N.M. Rothschild and some, prevailed upon or blackmailed or extorted, and there we get to the pedophilia, senior members of the United States government to outsource key strategic assets or government agencies or departments that would be required to execute the attempted coup d'etat of 911. Any idea what those three government entities would be? 
Okay, ask me the question because I was just posting something in the chat room because a woman in New York City who bought me a, a very nice white hat, which I'm about ready to put on, uh, she asked a question about where Diego Garcia is. And I said, I think it's in the South Indian Ocean, but I think maybe more properly, it's called the, well, what is it properly called? Is it the British? British Indian Ocean Territory. David, would you mind waiting till I finish the question before you? All right. Okay. Let, let's try this again. Okay. David, do you have any idea what the body of water is that surrounds the landing place of MH370 and the departure place of MH17? Yeah, the Indian Ocean. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, anyway, over to you. I got to put my white hat on because there's a lady in New York City that paid a lot of money to buy this hat. And uh, I'm not going to say how much money, uh, but... Believe me, it was a very generous gift, and I, if I can find it, uh, this might take me a while, David. Oh, I think I just found it. It's over my right shoulder. I'll be right back. Over to you, David. Okay, so I'm asking you what three government departments, irrespective of what time that was done, because I think one of them that I will name was done as early as uh, 1802. Okay, the... Uh the uh, U.S. Patent Office. That's one. Okay, what, you want me to name the other two with no further hints? Yes. yes. Okay, the uh, Department of Treasury. That's not what I would say. I would say it was the Defense Ammunition Center. Yeah, what I meant to say when I said Department of Treasury, and see what happened, I pulled my cowboy hat down uh, too hard and it squeezed my brain. I would say it's the United States Department of Ammunition Department. The Defense Ammunition Center. That's what I meant to say. Which, incidentally, is run by Serco and uh, procured 1.4 billion rounds of hollow point ammunition, which lends itself to being converted into biological bullets by filling the hollow space with, let's say, some combination of anticoagulants, hallucinogens, paralytics, or general other disgusting substances where you can actually tune, or they believe they can tune, the target for an, ex an ethnic, a genetic, or an ideological cleansing program. Yes, that's what I meant to say. Well, yeah, I knew you were about to say it, but I, th I felt that, you know, it was getting tripping between your tongue, so I thought I'd get it out for you. Thank you very much for getting out what was tricking beneath my tongue. <laughs> Uh, then the third and absolutely crucial entity for bringing in the Al-Qaeda sleeper cells was what, Phil? Uh, U.S. Customs. No, the National Visa Center. I meant to say the National Visa Center, but because Denise and I have an ongoing current issue with the National Visa Center, I did not want to finger them. So I'm glad that you fingered them so I can use this tape of this show to prove to anyone, including... Senator Ron Johnson, who is very pedophile friendly, and he's supposed to be uh, an advocate for veterans in the United States of America, and nothing could be further from the case. So if his staff uh, contacts me because of an email I sent out today, David, I don't think you saw the email I sent out 20 minutes before this show, did you? Not sure. I saw the ad. Now, the ad's good, but the email's better. Uh, if anybody within the sound of my voice, if you're still within the sound of my voice, know you were the only one. There was never another choice, and I'll love you until I no longer have the will. Anyway, I sang that song to Holly Gregg. Uh, but I'm going to get the email and post it in the chat room unless somebody beats me to it. Because when I'm doing my best work, it is always public. And boy, did I do some good work about, oh, about 42 minutes ago. And Denise, if you're looking at my face, I meant to, uh, I meant to clean this up, but I ran out of time when I had lunch because of some emails I got. David, over to you. Right. So now we have the United States Patent and Trademark Office which was probably outsourced to the United Kingdom in 1802, but maybe most people can't get their heads around that. We have the <clears throat> National Visa Center, 
that was absolutely involved in bringing the Al-Qaeda sleeper cells in, and that outsourcing was primarily driven by your sister when she was senior counsel for the detention and deportation program of the Immigration and Naturalization Service. And she is still watching you field, I absolutely know, and I do remember saying way, way back uh, when we talked about whether it's going to be Brother Abel, Sister Cain, or Brother Cain, Sister Abel, uh, whether you would like to kill her or she would like to kill you, and you decided that you'd like to be Brother Cain, right? Yes, I wanted to be the surviving member, which reminds me, if you consider all the things you and I have done, and we don't need to argue about who's done what and the value of your contributions or the lack of value of my contributions, between you and me, we have forced these pig fuckers into a corner where there's no way out. Now, do you remember a movie called No Way Out? I think so. Yes, Kevin Costner's uh, he and Am uh, Huma Abedin, or some other slut, uh, were in the back of a limousine in Washington, D.C., and uh, they were dealing with Russians and uh, intelligence. And isn't that sort of what we're doing, David? Oh, we're, we're not only dealing with it, we, we own the show. Yes, there's, uh, I think collectively, we're the only game in town. Have you ever heard that expression? Yep. Okay, good. I'm drinking bicarbonate water and I'm wearing my white hat and I'm telling the world that I sent a very important email and uh, I'm in my email account right now looking for it. Uh, but uh, the lady who feeds my dogs when I go to England just sent me an email. So I have to address that and then I'll get the email that I sent out to some banks. Uh, and one of the banks is extremely powerful and also felonious. Uh, that bank is the United Services Automobile Association, and they claim that they are uh, a bank and an insurance company that takes good care of veterans. No, they don't. Uh, they don't take good care of veterans at all, and they have 72 hours to make me whole. I'll leave it at that, and I'll post the letter, which I sent less than an hour ago. So, David, while I'm pestering the Wamandi State Bank of Duran, Wisconsin, the United Services Automobile Association of San Antonio, Texas, and a third bank that will not be named because uh, they're in over their head. And uh, I operate at a higher level than they do. And they don't know that what they did to me is unlawful. I do know it, but I'm not a vengeful person. In fact, God himself said vengeance is mine. David, over to you while I get these emails, emails plural, posted. Right, Phil. So in August the 29th, 1940, a man by the name of Sir Henry Thomas Tizard, whose son was a good friend of mine when I was working in the United Kingdom, he got on an ocean liner and he took a briefcase, actually I think it was a trunk, with all of the, the British uh, secrets that had been developed for the defense of the United Kingdom in the event of a attack by the Nazis, including cavity magnetrons, uh, identification of friend or fire, precision navigation, etc., etc., and he took them to the United States. And essentially he gave them to the Americans, and in return the Americans promised to switch on their production facilities and produce the kind of tools or devices needed for the ultimate victory in World War II. So I think uh, by that date, the British had produced an amazing device called the cavity magnetron. I think they had about nine of them that expanded the power of uh, transmission of radar pulses so that they could actually detect a submarine as it surfaced, which of course was a tremendous value in the war in the Atlantic to knock out those submarines. <clears throat> By the end of the war, the Americans had produced a million of these cavity magnetrons based on the British design. Also, I believe the British uh, took the design of the jet engine by Sir Frank Whittle to the Americans and the Americans picked up on that. Now, here I'm going to say, and I'm not pointing at America or the United Kingdom, I think there were there were industrialists and financial people on both sides of the ponds who looked at that transaction and exploited it to enrich themselves. And one of those organizations would be NM Rothschilds and Sons. 
Essentially, N.M. Rothschild and Sons, the investment banker for Serco, Queen Elizabeth II, and United States President Donald Trump, now straddles the Atlantic and the Five Eyes countries and has backdoored the Five Eyes surveillance systems to Israel. And without that backdoor, 911 would not have been possible. Because the Israelis, and I don't think it's just the Israelis, but particularly through N.M. Rothschilds and the global custodians that met on the 47th floor at that shareholders meeting on 911, they had access to the patented devices that either through negligence, recklessness, willfulness or fraud were the cause of the death of nearly 3,000 people in the Twin Towers. And so, to cut a long story short, Phil, I think we're now in a position, and I'm very happy to work on it with uh, Webster, to take the text, incidentally, I can't find the link, it, the link seems to be broken, to what you filed in the, Fort North, in the North Dakota court on the 1st of May, but that was never served. <coughs> we can rebuild or restructure that and make it a template for any injured community that has been injured through the wrongful deaths of people associated with negligent, reckless, willfulness or fraudulent use of patents, uh, we can allow those or we can help those injured communities and I would include 911 and 77 and Sandy Hook and the pig farm. Um, I believe we can help those communities file a wrongful death suit with our templates and make a movie that essentially shows do you know the difference between actus rea and mens rea, field? Yes, one is the guilty mind, and then that's the difficult one. The other one's more obvious, so I'll allow you the opportunity to mention that one. Okay. Uh, the mens rea approach to crime scene investigation works with the field of guilt and innocence. Did you it's say the, the field of guilt and innocence? Yes, I, yes, I did. Well, I'm not guilty of jack shit. Would you correct your statement? No, yeah, but you're innocent of other things. I'm innocent of everything. I'm a real Boy Scout. And the fact <clears throat> that I, I once used a uh, metaphor and an analogy to confuse the CIA, the FBI, the IUD, and the BFD, uh, because I used, to, I, I used to appear to be focused on pastel colors, I never was. I was always focused on the mission, and the mission is to reveal to the world and to support any um, key TAM lawsuit to recover what I am estimating is $84 trillion that should go in to the United States budget. And that is before we address the $475 trillion that France owes the United States of America. Now, have I completely uh, confused you, David? Ne never, Phil. Oh, well, I wouldn't say never, but I will settle out of court for that I didn't confuse you. <clears throat> and by the way, when I made the statement about the $475 trillion that France owes America, did you know that when the macaroni man, the little short fucker from France was over in DC last week, do you know that he and President Trump planted a little twig? Uh, where? In the White House lawn. Now, do you know, of course, apparently you don't, but uh, the, the twig that Macaroni Man, uh, I can't remember what his first name, it might be something like, oh, uh, well, let's say, Let's say, well, I can't say turgid. I'd have to say, I think his name, the, in other words, the prime minister of France, who is a slut of the Rothschilds, and he's married to his high school teacher. Uh, I think his last name's Macaroni, and I think his first name is Slutface, but they planted a tree. He and uh, Trump planted a tree in the White House lawn, and an able danger agent went there at 0219 uh, the night or oh, the morning after it was planted and removed the tree. Were you aware of that, David? No, I didn't feel. Have I, I, I have I ever lied to you? 
Um, occasionally, but you uh, you send out the signals where I know what is true and false, so it doesn't matter. Good. Well, keep it to yourself and don't squeal on me. Over to you. All right. So there are two kinds of activities in a crime scene investigation. There are people who go for to try and spell out the men's rare. And you can see those kind of people where I can start a conversation about the maneuver that took out the Pentagon. And the first question these people say, and I respect them, I don't disrespect them, they say, why would they do that? However, from a crime scene investigation and all the forensic economic skills that I've tried to impart to you, Phil, you know that that is not the right question. It's not the why, it's the how and the what. That is to say, it doesn't really matter what hit the Pentagon, it, what, what was the weapons platform that was able to push a circular hole about 12 inches, 12 feet in diameter, right through to the inner courtyard, and it certainly wasn't a Boeing 757. So you and I have got very skilled, I believe, with our shared approach in looking at the actus rea of the crime scene, which are the physical facts of the case. So on the one side with mens rea, you're looking at guilt or innocence. And the other side, you're looking at falsehood and truth, right? So for example, when you look at the buildings coming down, the Twin Towers coming down, and you see the explosion of hot gases that send 10 ton girders out of the top in a parabolic arc, where a 10 ton girder is embedded 100 meters away in an adjacent building, we know that is not gravity. So it wasn't gravity that brought those buildings down. It was smack sonic like material, or plausibly smack sonic like material, inside the elevator shafts. So I think the power of able danger is that over the years since that filing, we've understood that the strength of the investigation is built on whether or not there was a government script to frame the incident or the event that killed lots of people, and whether or not there was a government uh, cover-up involving the removal of evidence, technically it's spoliation of evidence, from the crime scene. So cut a long story short, Phil, what I'm proposing, and I'm discussing that with Webster, and it's an open discussion to any of the fans or friends of Able Danger, is to take that filing of the 1st of May, bring it into what we know now, create a, a, a template or a boilerplate, as it's sometimes called, for any injured community, and we can come back to what an injured community is, that they can file a wrongful death lawsuit. And I believe in the States, and I think that's true in Canada, you can go for triple damages if the defendant is associated with organized crime. Is it, do you happen to know what the situation there is in the States? Okay, I'm busy catching up with the chat room because Denise is worried about my left ear um, and the chat room is uh, alive and well with a lot of information. Could you just uh, shorten that question and I'll answer it immediately and what may become a 43 minute run on response? Can you go for triple damages in the United States for wrongful death if the defendant is associated with organized crime? Yes, it's called RICO, RICO R-I-C-A, R-I-C-O, trebling. Now, do you know what trebling means and do you know how to spell it? Well, I know what doubling is, so I guess uh, if you go from doubling to trebling, it should be fairly obvious. Have you ever gone from Birmingham to Klangolan? Uh, no, but I'm not sure you're pronouncing Klangolan right. How would you pronounce it, your lack of Welshness? <laughs> I used to go climbing in North Wales. Isn't it Klangolan? Oh, yes, I think you're right. I. I I take my hat off to you, you unworthy Brit. Uh, now, notice I said Brit. I didn't say twit or bitch. I was very politically aware and I said, yes, I'm wrong. Uh, but go ahead and tell me that one more time so I don't make, I, I know how to spell it by the way. And see, the problem is that it's not a real problem, but the people in Wales, like South Wales, they have a pretty heavy accent and they like to speak Welsh. Towards North Wales, uh, they have less of an accent and they speak English, but the town that Denise and I will be uh, holding the conference at, which is called Operation Sandy Wreath, um, S-A-N-D-Y-R-E-A-T-H. Some people will think it's uh, 
uh, commemorative meeting or commemorative conference to assage uh, the fraud of Sandy Hook. And, you know, who knows? It may be. It hadn't happened yet. It's happening between the 14th and the 20th of May. And we will be in the village that is spelled, actually, it's a town, or I think you could call it a city. Uh, it's spelled capital L, little l, A N G O L L E N. And if I had not already agreed with Denise that we should have our ashes put in the uh, River Urn, E R N E, near Enniskillen, Northern Ireland, I would say I'd just love it if Agent Vulcan, Agent Troy, Agent Bugs, Agent Gobsmack, and Agent Gob, I said Gobsmack. Okay, let's do this. Uh, Di oh, Dice. Yeah, Denise, Troy, Vulcan, Gobsmack, and Agent Badfinger. I would love it if those five could toss my ashes into the uh, the river that runs through, I think it's called D, D-E-E, -E. but the river that runs through, you can pronounce it later, the town in uh, North Wales, uh, it is the most beautiful and peaceful place that I've ever witnessed or been present in in my life. And I'm somewhere between 68 and 69 years old. And if this is still April, I can say with uh, a fair amount of confidence that I'm 68 and a half. David, over to you. Uh, right, Phil. So uh, the interesting thing about the idea that N.M. Rothschild uh, staged or structured the management buyout and IPO of Circo is as an investment banker, effectively, they would have had custody of what was being discussed, I would say, at the shareholders meeting on the 47th floor on the morning of 911 by Circo shareholders, including 10 global custodians, three governments being the United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia and Singapore, two pension funds, TIA and its equivalent in the United Kingdom, and one state, that is California. Now that would mean that NM Rothschilds would have at the back door into the exercise going on called Global Guardian. And with it, the ability to instruct its investees to inject fake radar returns into the NORAD system in Cheyenne Mountain and the various people that were supposed to be participating on the blue team side of the war game. Effectively, that gave N.M. Rothschild the opportunity to stand down America's defenses so that the attack could proceed and the assets in the custody of, I mean, obviously there's a human asset here, the National Visa Center, which would include the Al-Qaeda sleeper cells and hundreds of thousands of legal immigrants, thanks to your sister's manipulation of the visa center, who would be in a position through organizations like the Small Business Administration to an attempt an insurrection and overthrow the government of the United States. Now, where would they get the ammunition, the mortar shells, the penetrator bombers, like the one that took out the Pentagon? Did, you, you, say you, pen get? did you say penetrator? Yes. Uh, in 1977, I was driving a 1966 Rambler with a 232 six-cylinder engine, and there were two semis behind me that were irritated because uh, I was not going as fast as they wanted to go. And they were talking on their CB, thinking that any dipshit that was driving such an unworthy car wouldn't be able to afford a CB. And so I heard them talking about the little... I think they called it four-wheeler. Uh, they were bad-mouthing me and my Rambler. So then, are you ready for a CB voice, David? Yes. Uh, go ahead, good buddy. You got that golden penetrator. So I told them on the CB radio I was the golden penetrator. What do you think of that? <laughs> well, were you sober at the time? Of course I was. I didn't start drinking till I met you, and I haven't stopped 
uh, until, which reminds me, just a minute, Dave, I got to take a little gulp. Ah, feeling better now, totally refreshed. No, I was, uh, I had just uh, left the Marine Corps because they didn't recognize my value. And I was going up to fly for the North Dakota Air National Guard in, Fort, in uh, Fargo, North Dakota. And they didn't recognize my value, but I think the last 11 and, 11 and a half years of working with you, I think that clearly establishes my value. And I guess it actually, to some degree, well, to some small degree, you know, the residual effect probably will spill over to you. Whether it should or not, I'm not gonna say. I'm a gentleman. But anyway, uh, the Marine Corps couldn't use me. The North Dakota Air National Guard uh, didn't like my uh, troublemaker quality. But guess what? If the fucking people that fucked America on fucking 9-11 are ever brought to justice, I think you and I will be sitting in front of uh, President Trump and his three Marines as people that contributed uh, a very large percentage of the information that allowed President Trump to reopen 9-11 and cause Jamie Gorillic to probably have the largest expulsion of methane seen in the 21st century. Over to you, David. I think you're absolutely right. We certainly deserve a front row seat. <clears throat> and in fact, because you haven't compromised your expert witness uh, status, I think you'll play a key role in a successful... Uh, now, if, it, if I said the word prosecution, I think we would be back into the court, possibly with gold fringe flags around it, where we're talking about guilt and innocence. And you see, if I may be a little bit crude, feel I don't give a fuck about guilt and innocence. Excuse me, I, I was cleaning out my ear because Denise is worried about my ear. Did you say you didn't give a fuck about what? Guilt or innocence. I don't give but a I, fuck about it either. And my fuck is five times as big as your fuck because you I'm... Know? What's that? How do you know? Well, I know how full of shit you are. Oh, but that does, Anyway. No, no, go ahead. To... And I retract my statement. I do not know how full of shit you are. Right, right, right. Because I'm totally fascinated by what is true and what is false at the crime scene. And I think what we have now is the ability to update or upgrade the, um, the application that you made to the courts on the 1st of May of 2007 on behalf of Hawks Cafe versus the Global Guardians, where you were seeking, I think, uh, triple damages for the wrongful deaths associated with the victims of 911. And that was then, and this is now. And we so get 6% interest, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, the money that we're talking about is so huge, there's so many zeros, I think our heads will spin, but that's okay. Um, now, when I was talking with Webster, he said, you know, a lot of lawyers, they like to go on contingency basis, but they're very wary if the target doesn't have deep pockets. Yeah. Now, I pointed out to him and I'll point it out to, uh, I've just pointed out in the chat room that actually in the case of Circa and its shareholders, these people have extraordinarily deep pockets. How much? Like we're talking, well, we're talking over a hundred trillion dollars. Well, then let's just go for 67 trillion. Right. Whatever you want, Phil. Um, but what's going to be interesting is in order to maximize the benefit, and I believe the benefit should be maximized for what I call the injured communities, we don't need to give a bunch of money out to people who are just going to buy trucks and, you know, increase uh, um, courses on the golf course. We need to get it back into the uh, injured community to bootstrap the community for some of the damages that were suffered when the members were actually unlawfully killed. So just reading that, the communities would collect in this model a majority share in revenues from crowdfunded docudramas, which Able Danger would promote with five minute videos of the caliber of Craig's brilliant Able Danger intro, which is on the Patreon page, right? To show how victims in the community may have died at crime scenes as a result of Serco and its government, UK and Saudi Arabia, and global custodian shareholders, allegedly negligent reckless, willful, or fraudulent use of patented devices. 
So I've now identified in about six or seven crime scenes, and I'll just uh, pop them in one by one for you, the most amazing array of patented devices, starting with the ammo that would appear to have been used at the pig farm. Now, do you know or have you read a field what kind of ammo these people would appear to have developed? And remember Victor Rothschild, who was a major player in developing the, um, the Churchill's toy shop in World War II, was a chemist. And yes. Here is, go ahead. No, no, I, you go ahead and I, I'll allow you to finish the question before I give you the answer. Right. So now between 60 and 100 downtown prostitutes, and I don't give a shit whether they were prostitutes or not, I don't care whether they were First Nations or not, but they were women who had a right to live. They were at the depths of despair. They were highly marginalized. They were taken from the downtown east side out to a pig farm, and they were killed in front of an audience, I would estimate, of up to 2,000 people, many of whom had been flown in by your sister using the Con Air jets. Yes. And, watch. and I think that we can say, remember, it's a lower burden of proof when you're going for wrongful death. You're not trying to prove murder one. They took Robert Picton, or his nickname was Willie Picton, to court, and they tried to prove murder one in, I think, about six canonical examples where evidence had been found at the uh, crime scene. But the jury said there's not enough evidence of pre-planning and premeditation. So they put him in jail, double life sentence, consecutive life sentence for second degree murder, which is basically an accessory situation, to shut him up. Now, there's no way this turkey could have organized raves on a Friday night and brought in 2,000 guests, many of them from out of town, to the pig farm where there was a 600 pound boar running around a whole bunch of paraphernalia would appear up on the stage and a sit-down meal for up to 2,000 guests, which included, it would appeal, appear, cannibal feasts. So they ate the women that were cooked at the pig farm. Now, did you say, well, I'm, not, I'm unfamiliar. Did you say parenthetical? Parenthetically. I taught you that. I saw it last year. No, no, it was uh, August 8th of 2007. But I, I couldn't tell if you said parenthetical or genitalia well i didn't oh okay good that we don't have to discuss genitalia did i tell you about the book i got in the mail today unsolicited no. No. okay i'm going to give you in fact there's a question for the chat room when i went to the uh, post office box today i got this book from uh, some place that i will share with uh I guess I'll share it with the world. I got this book from the owner of the Cornerstone's Bed and Breakfast. And the name of the book is No Greater Valor. It's written by Jerome Corsi, C-O-R-S-I. So my question to the chat room is if anybody has an informed opinion of Jerome Corsi, uh, please don't put it in the chat room. Please send it to me privately, uh, F-I-E-L-D-M-C-C -C at yahoo.com. But I can't think of a bigger compliment, uh, and I'm not going to mention the owner's name. In fact, let me just see if uh, Agent uh, Vulcan's here. It starts with an H. Yeah, Agent Vulcan is here. Notice I didn't say Hugh from Utica. Um, he knows who sent me this, and on page 157, it's talking about the uh, battle of, or the siege of Bastogne, and the miracle that sealed Allied victory, and uh, chapter 8 begins on page 157 with a prayer for victory. This is General Patton. Do you have a prayer for weather? General George S. Patton question posed to Chaplain James Hugh O'Neill, U.S. 3rd army in a telephone call on December 8th of 1944. Now that should scare the shit out of our collective uh, opponents, but they, if they miss that, 
it's because they're adults and they couldn't hear, hear what I said. Uh, on page uh, 295 of the book called No Greater Valor by Jerome Carsey, it says this. This is page 295. The cross and the sword. The U.S. Army that fought at Bastogne was a brave and distinguished military force that welcomed God into their midst. I'll stop there, but uh, Denise and Hugh, would you both send me an email to remind me to, and Hugh, you probably know who sent me this, and it's neither you nor your wife, Agent Troy. Uh, Denise, I'm going to send you an email right now to let you know who sent me this book, but Denise and Hugh... I would like to bring this book to Klangolan, or however uh, David pronounces that, and I would like to have Hugh and his wife, Denise and I, uh, the Canadian woman known as Sierra Mike, and the guy from uh, Liverpool named Badfinger, I'd like for all of us to sign, and uh, I'll put Hugh in charge of this, not Denise or I, that's not proper. But Hugh and uh, his relative that sent me this book can make an inscription here, uh, you know, whatever their heart moves them to do. And then all of us able danger agents that are in, I can't pronounce Klangolan properly, so David, I'm going to ask you to pronounce it when I'm done. But uh, Hugh and uh, Denise, please remind me to bring that book, and we'll have a book signing at 9.11 p.m. on either Friday or Saturday night when we have dinner at the gallery. And anybody from Able Danger that shows up will be allowed to sign the book too. And um, if anybody wishes to buy a round of cheer, which could be mineral water with a lime slice, it could be something called, uh, let me think of what Denise gets. Um, it is a soft drink sort of that's orange and something. Oh, wait a minute. I'll come up with it in a minute. It's a... Um... Orange Aid? No, it's... Uh, in fact, somebody from England, including Denise, please tell me what that stuff is called that Denise drinks. It's basically a soft drink with orange and something else in it. Um, Ribena. It's what? Ribena. No, don't, don't worry. We don't have to know everything, David, because our chat room knows everything. Uh, let me just scroll down. Uh, Corsi, Corsi is a patriot. Go Banks. Okay, good. Uh, Agent Bugs. Uh, Agent Bugs, Denise. Or, no, no, no. Livery. It's not that. It's a... Uh, I can't believe I, I've actually... Oh, it's a J20. A J20. Thank you, Hugh. Oh, and by the way, Hugh, I think you know... I am very confident, Hugh, that you know who uh, sent me this book. Would you please tell that person that I appreciate the book and I'm going to bring it to your town or city. Uh, I will. Br this book will arrive in Klingolan, and I'm not pronouncing that right, I apologize. Uh, this book will arrive on the 14th of May. Uh, and then on a certain night, we will have a dinner that Denise and I will pay for, for Agent Vulcan, Agent Troy, Agent Badfinger, if he's there, Agent Sierra Mike, if she's there, uh, or anybody else who's an able danger uh, person. And it is J2O. And let's just see if Denise, yeah, Denise said it's J2O. Um, and that's when... When Denise and I go to places like the Wheat Chief or certain uh, pubs or restaurants, she orders the J2O, and when she drinks the J2O, I drink a J2O. Uh, it's orange, O-R-A-N-G. But enough about that, David. Over to you, and it'll be fun to see uh, how many signatures we get in this book. And I expect to come back from Wales, North Wales, by the way, I expect to come back from North Wales uh, either the 29th of May or one week later, whatever day in June that would be, which is probably somewhere around the 4th or 5th of June. I tend to travel back 
on Delta Flight 11 on Tuesdays because there's never been a Delta Flight 11 on a Tuesday that's gone off course. David, over to you. Okay, thank you, Phil. So I'm going to look uh, list uh, six uh, injured communities with the patented devices that would appear to have been used uh, negligently, recklessly, willfully, or fraudulently. What about vexatiously? Um, yeah, I, th I think that's more in uh, the area of slander. Oh, okay, never mind. Malicious or vexatious comments, right, that you can't back up. Yep. Whereas uh, this, th there's a truth line here because all of the devices that I've identified would leave a signature consistent with the facts of the crime scene and you don't have to worry about mens rea, right? Because the first most important part of a crime scene investigation, which I've been teaching you over the years, field, is the identification of the weapon. Yes, and, and you picked out the weapon from a group of three. What are the other two in the group of three from where you picked out weapon? From oh, uh, you mean weapon, opportunity, motive? Yes, but you just answered the question, so carry on, Professor. Right, right. Whereas the majority of people will go motive, opportunity, and weapon, and that allows your prejudices to override your better judgment, right? Because if you think Bush did it, or if you think the Queen of England did it, then you're going to find a set of circumstances that support your uh, prejudice. Whereas if we discover, for example, that uh, in the pig farm ammo case that we will be bringing, that Darren Rubin's biological active bullet systems and methods were used to shoot the women at the pig farm and allow them to bet on the victim's time to die with Howard Lutnick's real-time interactive wagering on event outcomes. Now, does Howard Lutnick ring a bell in your uh, labyrinthine memory field? Over to you. Yes. Did you say Harold Lutnick? Howard, Howard Lutnick. Yes, that's yes. He rings a bell, and I see that Braveheart just put up an image of uh, the monarch of the UK. Unfollow me, delete me, block me. I don't give a well. Anyway, people in the chat room can see it. Yes, I do know that, and I just held up uh, for a picture opportunity uh, the bottle of. Let me look at what it says. Crown Royal made it. It's. Uh, Northern Harvest Rye, which is a type of whiskey, and I've never had it. And that thing's been sitting right where it's at right now. In fact, Denise knows because she was here when the man from Canada brought it. And I believe it was in June of 2016. But that's for Denise to, uh, she'll, she'll correct me in the chat room if I'm wrong. But that thing's been sitting here, and it's a gift from Canada. Uh, and the wish of the giver... The man who donated it said, I hope that you uh, share this with everybody when you get the ranch in Texas, which I have uh, several recent conversations with a person who will be involved in the purchase of the ranch in Texas. And David, I'm going to say something that I do not expect you to believe. So you go ahead and tell me when you're ready for me to say something I don't think you'll believe. All right, uh, Howard Butnick was the chief executive officer of Cantor Fitzgerald, who very conveniently was dropping his uh, son off to the school on the first day of school. So he missed a shock and awe attack on his colleagues at the top of the North Tower, where 657 of his colleagues, including his brother, were murdered. Now, they weren't murdered at the time of impact because the impact was about, I think it was 102, maybe 20 floors, 20 floors below. But what appears to have happened is that the towers were blown up and that would certainly have killed them. The question is, coming back to my theory, a field and did anyone notice that David ignored my question? Uh, I don't know. What was the question, Phil? You ignored it. Never mind. Keep going. Okay. So now we've got this extraordinary technology that I think I tumbled on yesterday or the day before, because you know we had established, or we believe we'd established, that the lining of the six elevator shafts that were installed by ACE elevators of New Jersey Palisades 
we believe that they were lined with smack sonic insulation. Now I noticed a little further correspondence up in the chat room about the melting point of steel, which is 2000, sorry, um, uh, 2,800 degrees. I'm really yeah. proud of you. Guess why? Why? 99% of the people in Able Danger and 100% of the people in the government could not have answered that correctly, and you did. Do you mind if I just add something to it? What, what, what I just said? Yes, I, I want to be more specific. You're absolutely correct, but there's more information. Uh, that is that when the people building the World Trade Center uh, contracted to build those uh, two structures, and just to really infuriate and piss off the government, one of the World Trade Centers was 1,362 feet tall, and the other one was 1,368 feet tall. But the steel that they contracted for had to be guaranteed to withstand 2,000 degrees, but the steel that was delivered was guaranteed to withstand 2,800 degrees, and the jet fuel in an airliner, if it is in a perfect combination of oxygen and jet fuel, can only burn around 1,200 degrees. So if people just take a look at the jet fuel and the steel, they can know 100% for sure that 9-11 uh, was a big blowjob. David, over to you. Yeah, right. So, um, and uh, the reaction temperature of this particular configuration of smack sonic that we are speculating about, it would have two sheets of aluminum or aluminium as uh, the proper pronunciation of that is, uh, sandwiched uh, between sandwiching uh, what should be polyethylene, but we think is a viscoelastic uh, manifestation of rocket fuel, solid propellant rocket fuel. And all you need to do is to create a spark across the aluminum plates and you ignite the rocket fuel, which has a, re a, a reaction temperature of 5,600 degrees Fahrenheit, double the melting point of the steel. So anything in the immediate vicinity of that turns into a plasma. Did I teach you what a plasma was, Phil? As I recall, it was on the 8th of August of 2007. You and I were discussing when we should crack open this bottle of Canadian uh, Crown Royal Rye Whiskey, and you, should, you said, I, as I recall, that we should do it once we have identified the temperature at which the bodies were destroyed by fire in World Trade 1 and 2. Uh, the remainder of the bodies are thought to be gone, but that's not true. The teeth remain, and some teeth have been uh, delivered somewhere, and from a tooth, you can determine the heat of the fire that consumed the body, and that discussion, in case you're not remembering it as accurately as I do, David, due to your advanced age and early onset of dementia, I'm kidding about that part. Uh, you might not remember that on that same discussion on the 8th of August, 2007, we talked about Barry Swatero, the, the Boston, uh, the British Invisibles, the Boston Investment Corporation, Mitt Romney's mantle pants, and Bill Clinton's voodoo underwear, wherein he was told by a voodoo priest, which is an oxymoron, uh, you can't be, a, well, actually, come to think of it, most Catholic priests are also liars. No offense to Catholics, but a very accurate statement about the priest. The Jesuits from the Vatican are military and intelligence liars and they've deceived the Catholic believers. But that's not what you asked me. You asked me about plasma. Plasma, as I recall from your brief um, attempt to educate me, good luck with that, um, mm. is the lowest form of matter. Does my memory serve you well, David? Yeah, it's the smallest uh, form of matter that we can deal with, so it breaks down uh, atoms and molecules into neutrons and electrons and even goes beyond that. So it drifts away on the wind. And there's that very graphic image, I believe, where you can see the building as it falls and then the central 
aerials that are going to the transmitters or transmission systems on the roof, they seem to evaporate into thin air. Well, that's being, they're turned into a plasma. So it's quite extraordinary how you can look at a crime scene in terms of guilt and innocence, or you can look at a crime scene analysis in terms of truth or falsehood and develop, I believe, a very compelling argument that they've been using patented devices to create those effects. And as a result of their use of or the fraudulent or negligent use of those patented devices, we give Able Danger can deliver to the injured communities a potential for a class action lawsuit for damages in respect of wrongful deaths. And we're not talking 1 million, we're not talking 10 million, we're not talking 100 million field, we're talking a billion plus, right? If you take the 3,000 people who died in the commuting distance for the communities in the Twin Towers, and you put collectively that action together, their loved ones and their families, those whose ox has been gored, right, can bring this action, and able danger, I'm not quite sure of the proper term, not terminology, but we can manage the application to the courts for a, uh, damages for wrongful death. And we can help, and again, I'm not quite sure of the terminology, promote or market this remedy over the internet using our uh, programs and the interviews that you and I and our colleagues have with uh, talk show hosts like uh, Jason Goodman. And from here on, I'm going to emphasize that for Able Danger, that we, Able Danger, I don't say we have all the answers, but we have more of an answer than any other media organization or intelligence agency in the world. And I think I can say that without contradiction, because when we introduce this, the disciplined language of the, um, the patent office, for example, the Twin Towers smack sonic, the smack sonic sparks, and that would use Alcoa's architectural products double sheet aluminum panel and method for manufacturing thereof with FMC Corp's SCR, that stands for Silicon Controlled uh, Rectifier, firing circuits for high voltage control applications. So what they did feel is they modified the power system in the Twin Towers so they could be independent of cables being transmitted, transmitting power into the building. And they actually installed batteries and silicon controlled rectifiers to trigger the energy pulse that would generate the sparks in the uh, in the smack sonic sheet and create this uh, essentially solid propellant rocket fuel reaction that took the temperature up inside the shaft to 5600 degrees and anything within immediate vicinity of that would turn into a plasma so the interior columns of the Twin Towers were turned into a plasma. The internal support structure of the buildings collapsed and they fell under, under free fall and uh, under gravity. And that fits the particular characteristics of the patterns used for the device. So now, what are we going on to next? Well, I think uh, the one that appeals to me now, Field, is MH370. And I think we've identified the particular patent which was used, and it's known as the Boeing Company's Encryption for Asymmetric Data Links. Priority date, 2001, January, February, March, April, 4th of May of 2001. Now, what is a Boeing Company Encryption for Asymmetric Data Links? So what, what we have, just to put things in context, I believe Boeing directors have been extorted to move the Boeing headquarters from Washington State to Chicago in preparation for the 911 attack. Boeing Phantom Works, led by Dr. Pamela Drew, an American woman, actually installed a war room in the Boeing headquarters office in Chicago, ready to take over the planes that would fly on 911 through various decoy and drone maneuvers into various targets and set off a chain of events that they hoped would lead to the overthrow of the American government. So encryption for asymmetric data links, what they're doing is they've split the message into two parts. The header message, which routes the message and are basically a little bit of chit chat through the various devices that are gonna relay it to the destination. So it might be an E4B that the header controls a message for the people or the captain of the E-4B that's flying over Washington 
together with a little bit of uh, guff, you know, maybe a one word, a, a Twitter-like delivery, which says, blame this on Al-Qaeda or whatever. But the content of the message is more deeply encrypted, and that enters the Boeing Honeywell un uninterruptible autopilot of the various decoys and drones that are going to be flown on 911 through, I believe I taught you about ad hoc waypoints, is that correct, Phil? Yes, it was on the 8th of August of 2007. We were talking about ad hoc waypoints, plasma, the fact that Obama is a PFR, uh, mantle pants worn by the female that appears to be married to uh, what's his name from Utah, who thinks he's going to get the Senate seat being vacated by some P effort. And uh, also uh, Hillary's laundress, who Hillary, when, when Bill Clinton got back from a trip to Haiti prior to the, uh, the Clinton Foundation killing all the black people in Haiti with a U2, the registration number of which was 80-1076, uh, Hillary used to like wearing those, uh, I, I'm very, I, I don't like talking about undergarments, David, regardless of what you think. You can ask Denise in a private email. She'll tell you I have an aversion to using certain words. But if it helps bring down the Clinton Foundation, I will use these words. Hillary, who is known for having extremely uh, vile hygiene, really enjoyed wearing Bill Clinton's uh, boxer shorts. Notice I didn't say Barbara Boxer. I didn't say Diane Feinstein. I didn't say Nancy Pelosi. There's three blowhards from California who also like wearing boxer shorts. And they, they suffer this condition that my sister probably has the most notorious reputation for, which is called uh, felonious penis envy. But David, I know that you like to be somewhat uh, 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 reticent or moderate. Uh, I'm going to read two things that just came into me via email. Uh, Corsi thinks Kissinger is swell. Pro-Israeli whore. The first link should have made it evident. Then there's a YouTube and I'll publish this later. I got to clean it up so nobody knows where it came from. But there was a, uh, something published on March 25th of 2018 following QAnon posts and updates. I've noticed Jerome Corsi is always pro-Israel and endorsed as leading the charge. Why? Here's the video he deleted, queued up to the spot in question. Why does jo Jerome Corsi seem to endorse Henry Kissinger? Kissinger, excuse me. Why does Jerome Corsi say Kissinger is now acting as a white hat? Uh, if he's acting as a white hat, I'll eat my white hat and send the dollar value back to Captain McHale. In fact, let me put on my white hat before I can continue reading. Bear with me, David. I do this for a purpose. Uh, why did Jerome Corsi delete the video when we started to ask questions? Has InfoWars ever said the word Zionist? I think the answer is no. But that, that is a, uh, a very well-informed and well-stated uh, criticism of Corsi, but to be fair, uh, from somewhere in Western Florida comes this. Uh, uh oh, I just don't worry, it'll come back. Uh, I'm going to read two more. I just there's a lot coming in, David, right now. Um, okay, let me go back to the inbox. Bear with me because I do want to find out what Corsi is all about. Uh, okay, David, listen intently. Now, just to prove that you're listening intently, spell field backwards. D-L-E-I-F. Very good. I'm surprised and in, encouraged. Here's a um, message from Western Florida. Who let off the explosive charges in the World Trade Center? His wife was Swiss, and he believes he had Oh, yes. Okay. His wife was Swiss and he believes he had been MK altered. When you get some time, Agent Bravo Charlie would like to discuss this with you. And uh, to uh, Agent Lima Juliet Charlie, uh, he can call me 
and I will email you as soon as I turn it back over to David. So there we have uh, we have one person talking about Jerome Corsi, and we have uh, two people talking about Kissinger. But I want to read something from a person who shall remain nameless, who I've never received an email before. But I will say that it's uh, maybe it's a handsome Robin because the Robins are coming back to Wisconsin. That's why I said handsome Robin. In my opinion, Dr. Jerome Corsi is excellent, a believer, honest, and a warrior for truth. And then the handsome Robin, whose uh, chat room ID I just learned of, uh, and I will not share, uh, that party believes in Corsi. Well, the only reason I bring up Corsi is because of the title of the book, No Greater Valor. And I haven't read the book, but I'll tell you what, Denise and uh, Hugh, and if there's anybody else that's going to uh, our gathering up in North Wales on the 14th through the 20th, uh, I will try to read this book on my way across the Atlantic. Um, but when somebody says no greater valor uh, and yet is working with Alex Jones, I want to scratch my extremely hairy nuts. David, over to you. Well, that brings a terrible vision that I'd like to move on from. We'll move along. Okay, so we've talked about five uh, projects, starting with the pig farm, as a possible tool uh, at Able Danger to help injured communities bring uh, class action lawsuits, uh, damages in respect of wrongful deaths of their members in parallel with a docudrama that lays out the actus rea at the crime scene. So already, and I respect people who ask about Corsi and so on, to be honest, speaking for myself, I don't give a damn about Corsi. No, I don't it's either. The facts of the, it's the facts of the crime. I know again, or Kissinger, all of these people, we're all expendable within the matrix, right? Including Donald Trump and uh, Kelly, you and me, etc. What the matrix is doing brilliantly it's doing, it's generating limited hangouts, right? So they throw a bone in front of the media, the media snaps onto it, and it pulls the audience away from looking at the crime scene and the facts of the crime scene, and onto this field of fuzzy logic relating to guilt or innocence. And I believe now our, our, the principal strength of Able Danger is we can be diverted, we are brilliant at generating chaff, but we're totally focused on finding the truth and the falsehoods of the facts at the crime scene, the physical facts. So now we've just covered um, uh, MH370 asymmetric skyjack with the Boeing's encryption for asymmetric data links. The next project I think would be very attractive, and Webster suggested this, is uh, the Murrah building. Now, do people understand that these vermin actually placed explosives underneath the daycare center? The rider truck was uh, parked at the front, but there were bombs inside the building. And what kind of people can deploy people who would do that, put a bomb under the daycare center? Well, I'll tell you, Phil, it's your sister. Oh, you're and not telling me anything, no. My sister is the second most evil person in the United States of America, unless George H.W. Bush is hopped off the perch. Over to you. Right, so the name of that project, I think, we would be Conair Murrah Rider Truck. And the particular patent that was ne negligently, recklessly, willfully, or fraudulently uh, used to carry out that attack would be Jerome H. Lemelson's submarine patents, and I'll come to that in a minute, for prisoner tracking and warning system and corresponding methods. Now, you remember, your sister called you in December of 1988 and asked how she could handle or should handle the, a potential mutiny of prisoners being carried on what would subsequently be known as the United States Justice Prisoner and, Tra and Transportation System, or nicknamed Conair. Now, I only heard of this guy, Jerome H. Lemelson, about, I think, three weeks ago. Do you know how many patent uh, he was granted, Field? Over to you. 307. 605. That's what I meant to say. When I said 307, I was doing, you know, pounds and dollars are exchanged 
And I was exchanging 307 British pounds for how many uh, US dollars, 605? Yeah, that sounds about right. Well, I, I can't believe it because I know how much mental energy and technical technological expertise it takes to write a patent. In fact, I have a friend who has a cheesy accent uh, who actually patented something. And uh, between he and I, we don't think it's possible for one human to write that many patents. Would you agree with that, Your Lordship? Uh, yeah, totally. So what he was doing, and it goes back to the uh, uh, technologies around the Mendenhall's baby movie, right? He mm -hmm. was trolling around the work done in research labs. Presumably he had an intelligence uh, capability there. And they were telling him what Sony or various other companies were about to apply for in terms of patent. So he would sneak in, he'd apply for a patent, and it would be what's called a submarine patent. That is, it would be registered at the patent office, perhaps in the UK, perhaps in the United States at the Alien Property Custodian, which is Northern Trust of Chicago, but it wouldn't be published. And what he would do then is wait until Sony or whatever came up with what their research lab had been working on, and then he'd jump in and he'd sue them for infringement of his unpublished patent. Of course, that's a way of making a great deal of money, but this guy was very obviously a dirty player, um, and he wouldn't have been able to do that unless he had a very powerful intelligence organization behind him, and I believe that was MI6 field, or the United Kingdom Ministry of Defense. So this guy wormed his way into the patent office in the United States, and he put together, for example, a portfolio of submarine patents that would allow him to record a snuff film with patented devices, or quite uh, conceivably, your sister being sodomized by Nicholas Soames. I'm sorry to be talk about this nasty. In fact, I'm not sure that you can conceive if you're sodomized. Can you just uh, enlighten me biologically or anatomically if uh, someone who is sodomized can conceive from that uh, encounter field? Over to you. Well, it depends if the perpetrator uh, uses item A to enter a certain destination, uh, which could be item B or item C. If the perpetrator sticks his diminutive item A into an, I, I'm not good, I don't want to gross out anybody, you know. So uh, I will use the word V for the preferred destination for an item A. Uh, anybody that wants to conceive a human offspring, which is a blessing from God, uh, the male should put item A into item V, Victor. Uh, but if he's not good at aiming or if he's gay, uh, he might put item A into item S, which, David, can you remind me what the first letter in sphincter is? S. Oh, yeah, okay, good. Um, hu male human bodies have certain numbers of sphincters and uh, the female bodies have one more sphincter than the male bodies. Now this is getting pretty far down the anatomical uh, discovery mode, ADM. ADM is also one of the biggest private corporations in the government, uh, in the country, that is poisoning, perhaps, I said perhaps, don't sue me. Uh, ADM may be participating with uh, Monsanto, and whoever makes GMO crap like Agent Orange, uh, which is Dow Chemical, now that I put on my thinking hat. Oh, I took it off, let me put it back on. Whenever I'm thinking I need to wear a hat to keep my brain at the peak operating temperature of 98.9 degrees. Um, so, uh, so if somebody were to sodomize my sister, who probably is not very uh, fertile when it comes to uh, her reproductive health because she only had two kids and uh, I have had four kids. So I guess I'm twice as efficient when it comes to uh, child planting as my sister is. But then of course my sister's a lesbian. And actually, even though I share a lot of the same tastes, if you will, with the lesbians, for instance, what lesbians like I also like, but I like it within the uh, confinement of a marriage, not, not a relationship, a marriage. 
uh, my item A is uh, spoken for, and so nobody is going to get their item Victor or item Sierra serviced by me. Uh, and I think that's where our country, meaning the United States, has been led astray by your former country, the United Kingdom, because of Tavistock uh, and the Beatles. And uh, anybody that doesn't understand that should probably just turn off the radio show right now and go back. I think the Simpsons are starting two minutes ago. David, over to you. Okay, so just to remind people that we're not uh, embarked on a scatological survey of the sexual habits of field sister what we are pointing out is that in the interview that was published by judy mann in the washington post around august of 1979 a few days after the birth of what may be winston churchill's great granddaughter jessica uh, marcy um, that uh, reference was made to this extraordinary woman, Christine Mars's ability to function like a man, uh, to pass or take a law degree and be back at work the day after a baby was born, all of which I guess you might describe her as a kind of bionic woman, but with a very odd description of her child. Go ahead, David. Okay, of not uh, as Mars's baby, which would be her married name, or McConnell's baby, which would be her maiden name, but uh, Mendenhall's baby. Yeah, now, I'd never heard of this before, but we've looked it up, and in the Urban Dictionary, it describes, I make no apologies for it, I'm not responsible for the words that appear in the uh, Urban Dictionary or what usage they are on the street, but Mendenhall is described as to mount someone from behind and then roll them over to see the humiliation in their eyes preferably in front of a big audience. And that's kind of like, I think, what the ceremonies that were happening out at the pig farm, except that out at the pig farm, it would appear the prostitutes were shot by some derivation of these biological bullets. And then people were betting on how long it, they would take to die. In the case of Christine Marcy, Field's sister, it would appear that she was filmed by the aides or friends or colleagues of Nicholas Soames, the grandson of Winston Churchill, who was in Washington in uh, November of 1978 when the Mendenhall's baby was conceived. And he was working as a personal assistant to Senator Mark Hatfield, who was or would go on to become the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee. That would mean that uh, that appropriations committee would be open to blackmail and extortion by the Soames brothers. Rupert Soames would eventually become the chief executive officer of Serco, replacing a guy called uh, Chris Hyman, who was in the windows of the World Restaurant on the morning of 911 at a breakfast meeting, who got in one of these elevators that went down to the 47th floor where he addressed a meeting of shareholders that I believe had custody of the patent pool devices necessary to execute the 911 attack. Now, there was an early question from Field, I think, from someone in the chat room that said, who ignited or detonated the explosives used to bring the towers down? Well, I think we've identified that. And again, the organization that was controlling the detonation or time of detonation was controlled by Christine Marcy because at that stage on 911 she was the chief operating officer of the Small Business Administration with about 220,000 small businesses with a $70 billion loan portfolio and 7,000 banks in her bailiwick, if that's the right word, or her brief. And any one of those small businesses described as a protege company of Boeing would have been in a position to hijack Boeings through these intervention flight management systems and fly them into a building. And now we could ask, well, what kind of security checks are done on those 210,000 small businesses, which include facetiously, I apologize for being facetious, could be owned by black one-legged lesbians, 
but they're very unlikely to be owned by heterosexual white men. So there are Indians, there are Chinese, there are Pakistanis, there are Vietnamese, Koreans, Japanese, first generation presumably, that have got into the United States that plead disadvantaged by virtue of the alleged racial or genetic prejudices of uh, heterosexual white men. So they get a man in the middle position or a woman in the middle position in a war game like 911, and they use access to the patented devices to attempt to overthrow the government of the United States. We're still skating around on the edge there. I think the initiative that uh, Able Danger has established and the extraordinary work of the team is going to preempt that. And um, so my focus with Able Danger, uh, I believe, should be on the development of class action suits for wrongful death against Serco and the global custodians with $100 trillion of assets under management. And we need to make, um, I think they can be called teasers or trailers, except this is a trailer is normally written after the film is uh, developed after the film is produced but the beauty of uh, the kind of work that Craig does is I think we can put a very compelling five minute video together on the actus ray the facts of the case relating to these six episodes of wrongful death over to you Phil okay I'm I'm pretty good at math now do you know um, well actually I've got to give you a song to recognize somebody who just emailed me I'm no stranger to the rain I'm a friend of thunder, <clears throat> I'm a friend of thunder, Lord is it any wonder lightning strikes me. I fought with the devil, got down on his level, but I never gave up, so he gave up on me. I'll sing that when you leave, and I'll also sing something from the 60s, and hopefully it'll be uh, Little Town Flirt, no, no, not Little Town Flirt. Um, whatever, oh, hats off to Larry, or whatever the uh, ladies ask. David, I just, uh, I've been getting a lot of email and a lot of stuff, but you did say, did you not say six crime scenes? Yes. Why don't we think, uh, you do the thinking, you and Webster and Craig Peterson, who noticed for the record, I didn't say Craig Peterson, I clearly said Agent Tillman. So if anybody thought I said Craig Peterson with a K, they're mistaken, or they might have an ear injury such as this. But having said that, what do you think about posting in a public manner, like perhaps in a radio show in the next 30 days, that we will address these heinous crimes in the order of which communities uh, contact us first and uh, maybe we should put out a five-minute trailer for each of the six crime scenes, of which I will take. I will tell you the difficult three, and then you can come up with the, the easy ones. I don't want to overstress you. 9/11 uh, in New York City would be one. Uh, the Murrah Building, which Christine Marcy blew up, uh, would be one. And uh, MH370 in Kuala Lumpur, uh, which Christine Marcy's uh, only biological sibling uh, was called down to Kuala Lumpur to explain to the Malaysian government uh, and Malaysian Airlines Systems, MAS, what happened to MH370 and how it arrived at 0651 on the morning of 8 May, excuse me, 8 March 2014, how it arrived on Diego Garcia and taxied into a uh, Faraday cage-like hangar with both engines running. And when the engines were remotely shut down and the parking brake was remotely set, it triggered a OOI out, off, on, in. It triggered an in signal at 0651. And that's how the world came to know what happened to Malaysia 370 only because Able Danger and among the Able Danger team, Craig Peterson, notice I didn't say anything about Agent Tillman, I clearly said Craig with a K Peterson, uh, put together a five minute and 40 second YouTube, which you can find on YouTube. It is titled Boeing Uninterruptible Autopilot. What if we started a bidding war between those six communities and saying whoever offers the most money 
after a 30-day period. In fact, if any of the six communities don't offer a fee, we can question their validity or their innocence. But whoever offers uh, Able Danger the most fee, uh, which would be repaid, uh, the attorneys that are good at contingent crap, uh, they would help us figure out how to repay whichever community coughed up the most production money because you can't make uh, you can't make a compelling video documentary. Which reminds me, Denise, uh, the video documentary guy contacted me, and so when we talk here in about thirty minutes or less, uh, remind me. But there's a man over in England, David, who does uh, video. He'll do documentary movies for theaters, or he'll do uh, some other video format to get documentaries done. But uh, So I gave you the three uh, difficult ones. It's hard to remember 9-11. It's hard to remember the Murrah Building, which was done on some day in April of 1995, which is the favorite day of the uh, New World Order for doing acts against humi uh, humanity and also MH370. So I said 9-11, MH370, and Murrah. What were the other three that are easy to remember? Uh, the Pentagon bomb. Yep. Um, Pan Am 103. Uh-huh. And the Pig Farm. Oh, well, I hope Vancouver coughs up money because that way Webster and uh, Denise and I could come out there and we'd stay in the Pink Hotel. Now, when I say Pink Hotel, do you have any idea what I'm talking about in Surrey, British Columbia? Yeah, yeah, you stayed there. The pink, they call it the Pink Palace, and you stayed there when you came up for Mary's um, memorial service. Yes, I did, but I stayed there under an assumed name. Uh, uh, um, yes, I thought, weren't you a Rockefeller for this, that day or something? Actually, you're close. I was a Wright. Uh, you remember uh, the Orville Wright and Wilbur Wright were brothers? Yes. Well, I'm their great-great-grandson, born of a different mother, and and I signed into the hotel as seldom, S-E-L-D-O-M, seldom right. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, no, I, I think that's, you, you're thinking, this is great, Phil. And what I think the collective team, the inner core team, if you will, uh, Tim and you and me and uh, Craig and uh, Webster, we might identify maybe up as many as 10 crime scenes where a injured community has a legitimate case in a civil action for wrongful deaths because there's clear evidence of a government script having been prepared before the murders or the, um, the wrongful deaths take place and then a government cover-up where evidence is taken away or manipulated at the crime scene. And I did teach you the technical phrase for that felony field. Do you remember? Yes, I do. It was uh, fenestration. F-E-N-E-S-T-R-A-T-I-O-N. Fenestration. Yeah, almost the right number of syllables, but I think you mean spoliation. Yes, that's what, when I said fenestration, I clearly meant spoliation, but right back at you, Professor, do you know what fenestration is? Yeah, it's the area around a window. How did you know that? I know everything. Oh, that's right, I forgot. Okay, what time am I going to kick you off this radio show, Mr. Well, Lador? I, let, let me just Let's just finish up that concept, you see, because I don't think we need to get communities to get into a bidding war for our attention. I think with that five minute, and I think the teaser is a nice phrase because a trailer is normally prepared after a film is made, right? Yeah. But the teaser could lay out the storyline yep. using graphics and not identifying any people who might be scared of sticking their head above the parapet. And I respect that because there's a lot of very, very frightened people in the downtown east side area associated with what really happened at the pig farm. So with Craig's brilliance, we could put together those kind of five minutes where he might be interviewing me and then dropping in images that help me communicate through imagery. And he's very good at that. Actually, Jason Goodman is also very good at that. But uh, Craig is, uh, you know, we know what Craig is capable of doing. So it could just be a five minute. We then can put that up on our website. Let's say the six projects, and it could be up as many as 10. And we invite people who believe A, that they are capable of bringing a legal action or lawsuit for wrongful death on behalf of the community and be a producer, a film producer who can demonstrate they have the interests of the community at heart and would be able to identify actors and extras and camera crews like 
for example, up here in uh, Vancouver, this is Hollywood North. There's hundreds, if not thousands of people who are capable of putting an extraordinary um, movie, a docudrama together based on our five minute teaser. And then we, through Able Danger, we invite crowdfunding of each of the projects. So we wouldn't move until we've A, got a lawyer who is capable of uh, bringing the class action suit for the community, be a producer who can produce a quality film. And now I don't want to constrain them from a creative point of view, but you know, when you're branding or marketing, you have to get the same look and feel. So for example, we might through Jason Goodman define a, a kit that would be able to produce uh, a movie of the right caliber. Remember the Blair Witch Project was an amateur film that produced a very significant amount of money. And then Webster is talking about commissioning some music. And I know you have a great love of music because he has four or five uh, composers. So just like James Bond series has, you know, that very iconic music, why wouldn't Abel Danger with these uh, docudramas have an iconic start to the movie and an, an iconic teaser to promote the idea on the global web over to you? I think it's all a very doable idea. And when do you have to sign off? Uh, I might as well be ready to go now, right? But do you have to leave? After you um, sign off, can you stay for three minutes? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, then watch this. Uh, I don't know if Karen S. is here today. I don't know if the woman married to Barefoot Calvary is still listening. I don't know if Gobsmack is listening. But surely one of those three can find the YouTube of Secret Agent Man by... Uh, David pushed the wrong button. David, go ahead. Yeah, I got confused. Uh, I realized I pulled out, but I wanted to stay on, right? For three minutes. Well, then when you say pulled on and stay, stay on, are you talking about consummating a relationship between a male and female uh, mammal? Well, you're putting words in my mouth, but no. Well, it could be worse. I could be putting something in your S. Uh, because remember, there's item A, item V, and item S. But go ahead. Thank you for that anatomical uh, insight, Phil. 